I'm Michelle Lim. That's the X. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm usually covered in clay. You can find me in my studio making pots. And that's me on the wheel. And that's what I do for a living. I play with clay. I'm a potter, a ceramic artist, a clay nerd. There are lots of terms for this. But I'm not going to talk to you about pottery or ceramics today. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story about a dragon. And a particular dragon, because this dragon was a sleepy one. It had in, been in slumber for about 30 over years, and it took a whole community to wake it up. Now, we all know dragons as powerful and mythical creatures, don't we? But did you know that once upon a time, Singapore was a land full of dragons? Dragons that are as big and long as stories tell us, dragons that breathe fire. These dragons I speak of are actually dragon kilns. They help aid the process of making ceramics. So the concept is simple. You have fire and you have clay. Together, they produce ceramics. So now that you have got that idea, I'll show you some uh, dragon kilns around the world. We have them in Australia. In China, this is an ancient dragon kiln where it originally came from. Next door in Malaysia, Ipoh. And Korea as well. So these are just a few examples. There are plenty around the world. You can check them out yourself. If you notice, there's one thing in common, not just its length, but that it's always on an inclined slope. So let me show you. This is the head of the dragon, where the flames come out from, where the dragon breathes fire. It looks like it's breathing out fire, but what it's actually doing is when you open the dragon's mouth to fuel it with wood, out comes the flames gushing out, grabbing oxygen to grow bigger. And then right through the belly, and out from the chimney comes a cloud of smoke, just like the drawings that we see in, in storybooks of dragons, where the dragon is floating in a cloud and breathing out fire. So you have the head and the tail, and now the undulating body of a dragon is actually formed because of the expansion and contraction over time. But that's not what's amazing. To me, the most amazing thing about dragon kilns is that this structure is held up by nothing other than the physics of an arch. There's no pillars or iron poles or anything like that. And so we have these amazing creatures amongst us as well. It, from the late 1800s, dragon kilns, this technology came to Singapore. Um, we had about 30 over dragon kilns in Singapore, and now, because of urbanization, as you understand, we're left with two. This is called Guan Huat. Every dragon has its own name. Guan Huat is the sleepy dragon that we've tried to wake up because for about 30 over years, it's not been fired since it got abandoned. Guan Huat is about 42 meters long by 2.5 me meters wide. It's pretty huge as well. And right next to it is Tao Guang. They both lie in the vicinity of Jalan Baha, the west of Singapore. So these huge dragon kilns are actually, um, they come from an industry, a ceramics industry. If you imagine, Singapore was full of these dragon kilns, right? About 30 of them. Just in Jurong itself, we were told that there were nine dragon kilns. And if each of them are so big, can you imagine the inside? So this is the dragon's belly. It's almost like an MRT tunnel. We could link arm in arm and walk right through this um, dragon with no qualms at all. In each kiln, for example, in Guan Huat, you could actually fit about 40,000 pots. This meant that, yes, we had an industry in ceramics, but it wasn't just an industry, it was a booming and dynamic industry. What was put in these um, kilns, you might wonder? Well, the ceramics industry also supported others, such as the rubber plantations. So if you remember a time when we collected latex, those cups were actually made of ceramics and fired in a dragon kiln, together with other industries such as the orchid industry, where they needed pots, also made of ceramics also fired in a dragon kiln. So on and so forth. I mean, you would have your crockery pots and bowls and such. So you probably are wondering then, if this is such a long and deep heritage that we had in ceramics, how come we don't know about it? Take me, for example. I actually went to Australia in 2007 to do my degree in ceramics, thinking that I would never find something like this in Singapore to learn about. So it's ironic then that in my first year of uni, I opened a magazine that the library was about to throw out. I still remember it was 1979 edition of Ceramics Monthly. As I opened it, I saw Singapore Dragon Kilns. And I was like, what? 
I came all the way here, and then now you're telling me that Singapore has dragon. So I was like, okay, never mind. I'm during my holidays. I'm gonna fly down and I'm gonna search for these dragon kilns if they do exist. And so I finally came into this jungle. It was a thick, thick jungle in the midst of Jalan Baha, and I came into paradise. There were pots, dragon kilns, and nature. Above us would be eagles swooping around. In the evening, um, wild boars would peek out to see what's out there. At night, um, the fireflies would just light up trees. It was just beautiful. So you can imagine my devastation when in 2011, after my graduation, I came back to this. They had cleared the jungle and flattened the land to build an eco park. This was when um, I had a dinner and discussion with Post Museum. We sat down and we decided, you know, we got to do something about this. Many people like myself don't know about it. And if someone like me who's so interested in ceramics don't even know about our own history and heritage in ceramics, much more the rest of Singapore, our children, our future generation, and the rest of the world. And so we decided to come up with Awaken the, the Dragon. It isn't just about waking up this um, sleepy dragon that hadn't been fired uh, in its entirety, but it was also about awakening the community and making them realize that we have this rich culture in ceramics. So we knew the three of us would never be able to uh, fill up the whole kiln. I mean, you saw how big it is. We needed thousands of people. And so we started off with a training workshop. We got our friends and family, close friends and family together, and we started to train them. We weren't training them to make beautiful pots or ceramics or anything. Instead, we were asking them to help us share the story of the dragon. We were asking them to also help us connect with the community. We wanted the community to realize how important this dragon was to them. It isn't just a space um, that reminds us of an industry, but it was a physical reminder of the kind of people we were. We were once people who made things, who knew our land, who did things with the land, made things with our hands. We were makers and doers, and that's what was important, and that's what drove us. So in connecting with the land, we decided to use Singapore clay. We dug out clay from different parts of Singapore, added it with a bit of water, and we produced local clay. The idea is quite simple. We wanted people to tangibly connect with the land. I mean, how many of us has made anything from Singapore, right? So in our workshops, we got our participants to mold something with their hands using Singapore clay, and then together, we would collect the thousands of works to fire it in this dragon for the first time. And so we began. We went to different places all around the island. We were trying to reach out to the biggest cross-section as possible. And so we went to offices. Anyone that had 15 people or more, we would come down, bring our clay, bring our story, and we would share with you our dragon story. The idea was to bring a community together and so that we could wake this dragon up. So we went to schools. We went to old folks' homes. We went to void decks. We went to community centers, libraries. Sometimes we went to parks and gardens. People, someone's condominium where they had a community, cafes, and quite a few of them actually said that they want to see the dragon itself. So we brought them to the dragon kiln and gave them live tours where they went inside the dragon kiln and came up and made work to put inside the kiln later on. In more intimate settings, we went to people's home. Uh, for example, this was a home of um, a friend and she wanted her family member who had cancer to experience this as well, and so we went down. It was these um, intimate moments that we found very special and spurred us on. So after every workshop, we would have a documentation session. And in the documentation, we would take a photo of the person, of the participant, its work, the work that she, she or he made, and the number that was attached to each work. Each work and each participant got a very special number so that they could recognize it after the firing. And these numbers ran from 1 to 3,000 over by the time we were done. So as you can see, the participants were really quite diverse. All, you know, it ranged from a huge age group and all sorts of people. But it wasn't just a one-way thing. We weren't just sharing one story and expecting nothing back. It was also amazing that people shared their story with us about their dragons. Um, some of them said that they used to work 
or they live in a kampong and they used to work in a dragon kiln, or they knew someone who did that. Someone told me that their grandfather used to own a dragon kiln back in the day when it was still very vibrant industry. And so these were the stories that were exchanged and made every workshop interesting for our facilitators and ourselves. And some of these participants were also um, quite touching because they came forward without us asking and they said, if you're going to fire this huge thing, I'm sure you need some help. So this is Ian, together with many other volunteers like himself, he was helping us cut some wood. And this is him and his wife helping us cut wood into the kiln during our repairs. And some of the students from Wheatley Secondary School, in total we counted about 100 over volunteers that came forward in different activities because it wasn't just about the gathering of wood or bricks or works, it was also the firing of the kiln that needed three days, three nights, 24 hours. So there was really quite a lot of work. S these are some of the participants. One of them here was actually having a sabbatical. And instead of enjoying herself on a holiday, she came down because she was so fascinated about this history. She came down almost every other day to help us pack the kiln, carry wood and such. So many hands make the work light. Eventually, we managed to fill up the whole kiln. This is only one quarter of it. But as you can imagine, it really took quite a lot of work. So workshops aside and reaching out to the communi local community aside, we also had to reach out to the international community. No one has fired this kiln in a very, very long time. And we tried to find someone that knew how to fix this kiln or if it, just to assess it. But no one in Singapore could tell us. So we had to reach out to the international community. This is my friend Ian Jones. Um, we got him over, he kindly gave us his time and expertise and told us that uh, you needed to do some repairs on the kiln, right? Because it's so old. But other than that, we were also told that we needed six tons of wood. So wood is not just a really hard thing to find in Singapore. I mean, we're not exactly surrounded by forests and woods. So the thing is, we also needed to convince people that what we were doing is not going to harm the environment. It's carbon neutral, in fact. Because the wood that we got was actually from industries, from furniture factories, from companies and industries that took their discarded wood and brought it to an incinerating plant, paid money to bring the, the wood there and burn it off as trash. So what we were doing is actually grabbing this wood from them and saying, hey, let's use this wood for a good cause, for transforming a community and making art. One of the interesting stories that came out of salvaging wood was Ng Ying Ting's house. So if you know Ng Ying Ting, he was our late um, artist in Singapore, a very famous artist who started his career in pottery. In a, a few years ago, after he passed away, Edmund Wong, our friend, and his family actually attained Ng Ying Ting's house. Um, unfortunately, they could not conserve it for heritage, and so they appealed to us, and they said, please take as much um, wood as you need and use it for the dragon kiln. So this is a photo of me literally sawing the, the wood. And it was the, a rather heart-wrenching moment because it's not like we didn't want this to happen. We didn't want to see the house go away. But as you can see from the photo, um, the machineries were there. They were ready to demolish it at any time. And so we had to do so. We had to cut the wood. But we felt that it was also quite appropriate. At the end, this was quite a poetic way to end Ng Ying Ting's legacy. We took his last memory and put it back into the kiln where he first um, got inspired to do his art, where he first got inspired to do pottery and, and study sculpture. So this is finally the opening night um, at the Dragon Kiln. The wood was used to light up the first fire. And this is Mrs. Lee, our guest of honor, who used to work at the Singapore Tourism Board and first brought attention to the Dragon Kiln in the 1990s. She very graciously let us uh, have her as a guest of honor and put in the first wood. We had quite a few pieces from Ng Ting's house. Um, and we expected about 100 other people on that night itself because we thought, you know, it's in the middle of the jungle in Jalan Baha. Can you imagine the traffic, um, the, the jam? And it's at night, it's right after work. People will be hungry. It's a weekday or weeknight. And so we really didn't expect many people. But on that night itself, we had 300 over people turn up in this dragon kiln, which we thought many people wouldn't have heard of, right? But obviously, word had spread. And on the opening night, 
uh, many people actually raised their hands and said, can we have a piece of wood as well? We want to commemorate this occasion. And as each person came forward to put in their wood, they also told us the, the community they represented. One lady actually said that she represented the, the tourists in Singapore because she was a tourist from Holland and somehow managed to find her way into the dragon kiln that night. And there were many other communities within the community on that night, the community that gathered around the dragon to wake it up. So you could really feel on that night um, how the pulse of the dragon began. The heartbeat, you could almost feel its heartbeat as people weaved in and out, as you heard people chatter, as strangers became friends, and as people started to share their stories of their own experiences. And this is a photo of um, some people gathering around the flames and people also putting wood into the kiln. We allowed others to have that experience as well. So people were not just um, doing those activities, but also sharing food. And food was another interesting thing for me because um, when I calculated the budget, we, I realized that we didn't have enough to feed the 100 odd people we thought would come. So I appealed to the artists who actually work in that area and I said, um, could all of you just bring a dish or two? Because on that night, we we're expecting 100 over people. So it was quite amazing because on that night when 300 of our people came, we had more than enough food. We had drinks and fruits and food and dessert. It was a spectacular moment. It was beautiful. On every other event during that week, um, those were also filled up. It was pretty spectacular because none of us had done this before. I'm an artist. I make pots. Um, Post Museum are also artists and curators. We have never done something so big before. And so when every other event got filled up, it was really heartening because we realized that we were um, not just talking about a dragon and people were honestly interested in just this community and it went beyond the dragon kiln, in fact. So this is a picture of um, Erin giving a talk. Erin uh, is our friend from Australia. Quite a few of the ceramic artists, when they heard about the dragon kiln, flew down from Australia, from Manila, and they all contributed without asking anything in return other than being part of this huge family. Local artists also participated in giving free demonstrations and workshops that week. And when there were talks and language was a barrier, somehow, magically, a person would come up to interpret whether it was Teochew or Hokkien or Mandarin or Malay. And so, Yes, it was the local community, but it was also an exchange between the international community that gave very freely as well, and the local community. Other miracles um, that occurred during that week were things such as the media. When we didn't do much um, of a media outreach because we were just so busy, the likes of BBC came down to cover every night of the firing, and every day of the firing as well, because it was a three-day, three-night, 24-hour firing. So we're really touched by all these efforts because we know that it wasn't us that reached out. It must have been someone else who heard this story and reached out to a journalist or a reporter. And this just started the momentum going without us really pushing for it. So the finale was at the National Museum where we finally unpacked the whole kiln, the thousands and thousands of works. From head to tail, we displayed it in the museum as well. And you could really see as people came to check out their works, it wasn't just because you know, it's the first time they get to exhibit in the Museum of Singapore, but it was, I suppose, for a lot of them, it was the first time that they could connect with the land again, reconnect with the land, and reconnect with the past that they thought would be forever forgotten. So you can see some of them were really excited and pointing out friends and participants that they didn't know actually took part in the festival and others would compare their works with each other. Um, because in different parts of the kiln, the works would turn out differently. And so this was exciting for quite a few of them as well, to, to see a firing of the dragon kiln for the first time. So the good thing is that most of the works survived. About 90% of them survived, and they look really good. Um, the whole kiln is safe, thankfully, even though we fired it for the first time, and possibly some of us didn't know what we were doing. Um, Although some other works were maybe more blessed than others, okay? Like mine, for example, this is my pot. 
Um, it's still intact, not broken, but somehow this the dragon kiln decides to let go of a brick and it is now perpetually stuck to my work. It's not just one work, it's not just two, it's not just three. About four of my works all have dragon bricks on them. I, I just think that the dragon really likes me. I'm not going to think otherwise, okay? So, um, all these things were really amazing. I mean, the, that, the fact that the kiln survived the firing, um, even though it hasn't been fired for so long, the fact that the community came together and awoken this dragon together, because really without the mass of works, the heat would not rise up and it would literally not be able to fire it up. And it's also amazing that how uh, word spread out, because until today, we still get emails from around the world, like Europe and the States, saying that, hey, um, they would write to us and say, hey, we heard that you have a dragon kiln. Um, is it possible for us to participate in it someday? When is your next firing? Things like that. So it continues to grow, and all these things are really amazing. Um, but I think one of the biggest bonuses came in the form of a phone call. We were one day informed um, that the National Heritage Board was going to help support these dragon kilns, and they were going to ask for a renewal because these two dragon kilns lease were going to end this year in December, which means they were about to demolish them as well. Or, as well, something was going to happen, we don't know what. So, officially in September, it was made in the news as well that the two dragon kilns are going to have their lease renewed for another nine years. So it wasn't just a win for us who did it. I mean, we don't work there, we don't own the kilns. It's a win for the rest of Singapore who never had a chance to see it, but now will always have that heritage and can always be proud to say that they were once people and they can be people who make and do things and know how to use their land. So we started off, Awaken the Dragon started off um, as a project, a not-for-profit project by myself and Post Museum, the three of us. Um, and it just grew from strength to strength with many other people joining us, volunteers and friends. We started with no budget, um, but eventually the likes of National Arts Council came and gave us some grant and many other people also started to fund us. And when there were lots of obstacles ahead of us, for some reason, miraculously, people would come forward and say, you know, do you need a hand? We can help you in this area, in that area. When we didn't have accommodations for our international artists, strangers, literally strangers, would say, I heard you need a room. How many artists are coming? You know, you, they can stay at my place. Um, so these were the things that really made me think, I think people, er, most of us, all want to be part of that change, all want to be part of that bigger picture, as long as we give them the opportunity to. Or maybe sometimes we need to make that opportunity for ourselves. Well, the dragon is now back asleep, and it will be awoken again in 2015 November. So do join us at that time. This is my story of the dragon kiln. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.